So my name is Rebecca Wolvix, and I'm one of the organizers of the Stanford Complexity Group. Um, and I'm delighted to introduce Woody Powell as our speaker today. Um, you may have noticed that Woody is claimed by numerous departments here at Stanford. I, I won't enumerate them all. Um, but I will say that he's also an external faculty member at the Santa Fe Institute and has previously taught at the University of Arizona, MIT, and Yale. Um, Woody's main research interests are in organization theory and economic sociology. And um, from the beginning, his work takes an approach that will sound familiar to you if you are familiar with um, complexity. So his work shows how micro-level relationships collectively create um, emergent macro-level dynamics. So, for example, um, to conduct his groundbreaking analyses of the biotechnology industry, um, he amassed a database detailing thousands, I don't know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Yeah. Um, Small network. Okay, of, of unique collaborations between um, biotechnology companies, universities, um, government institutions, and other players um, from the 1980s up until the last decade. Um, and then using network analysis, um, he was able to derive from these interactions um, general tendencies or rules um, stemming from the network topology of the field. Um, these rules are not static, but they change over time as the field evolves. Um, so they illustrate the um, concept of path dependence. Um, needless to say, he's won numerous prizes for this work, um, including the American Sociological Association Max Weber Prize. Um, I'm not a sociologist, but I do know Max Weber. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing that's a big one. <laughs> um, his well-known earlier work on institutions such as the Iron Cage Revisited and the New Institutionalism and Organizational Analysis um, similarly shows how institutional practices emerge through lower level dynamics um, and how divergent views become settled. So he's um, kind of forging a middle way between explanations that appeal to um, deterministically to structure or, and um, on the other hand, explanations that appeal more atomically to individual agency. Um, Woody's current projects include research on nonprofits, having already edited what's been called the Bible of Scholarship on the nonprofit sector. He's now working on a research initiative through the Stanford Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society on the use of metrics and evaluations in the nonprofit world. Um, and he continues his work on the biotechnology industry, looking at um, geographic distribution of expertise, um, <coughs> on interdisciplinary collaborations in the life sciences. Um, and finally, we greatly appreciate Woody's enthusiasm and support for the Stanford Complexity Group. So um, please welcome Woody Hill. Thanks, Rebecca, and thanks, everyone. This is kind of a distributed universe here. If I look at you, you're about the middle of the room, so it's uh, going to be a little challenging to figure out the, the landscape here. Um, I'm here doing two things. One, um, uh, supporting the, uh, uh, the group of students who've been involved in uh, um, uh, this complexity uh, initiative. So uh, I've been really pleased that their energy and their efforts and, uh, and spoke to their group last uh, fall, so I'm going to continue that. And second, I'm uh, plugging a new book, which unfortunately I don't have a copy of right yet. I have the cover, um, but uh, there have been a lot of issues about getting the book out, not the least of which is getting this cover right. Um, but let me describe the cover, because the cover is in some ways captures um, what, uh, what we're trying to do in the book. I'm going to give you a fast, 15, 20 minute overview of the book, and then I'm going to drill down and take one chapter out of it and talk about it. Um, so, maybe if more lights were out, you can see better, but that serpentine rock up there is a uh, photomicrograph. Um, 4.5 billion years ago, Earth uh, was simply vaporous rock. Um, but 3.7 billion years ago, Earth was teeming with unicellular organisms. So the creationists actually got it right um, on some dimension, uh, without, not in any kind of biblical sense, but you know, at one level, out of the murk and the muck, you know, 
on the coast of Western Australia, um, the earliest microorganisms uh, formed uh, above these serpentine layers. And this is uh, a photo of uh, um, the fossil record of the oldest thing on Earth. Um, so we're trying to make it the, uh, the cover of the book. The book is dedicated to a sociologist, Harrison White, uh, who has kind of inspired the study of multiple networks over time. Um, and so he's our, uh, our maestro in this. Um, it's a monstrous book, um, 19 chapters. We started on it in Santa Fe in 1999. Um, it's deeply inspired uh, by an effort to marry biochemistry and network analysis. Um, so for a lot of people, that will seem like an unholy alliance from many social scientists' point of view. They're kind of, what do you need biochemistry? From biochemistry's point of view, you guys really don't understand the biochemistry well enough to be trying to build models out of it. But the core idea, this idea of autocatalysis, which we worked out, which is worked out in three chapters, um, where we review, John Tadgett reviews Santa Fe style work and develops agent-based models to try to tackle this question of emergence. And then we proceed to look at what we think of as important inventions through time. Um, so modest idea, seven centuries. Uh, we could begin with the Renaissance and the formation of the partnership system in the Renaissance, the creation of the stock market in the, the early prosperous Dutch Republic, uh, the invention of the modern state uh, in many respects by Bismarck, the creation of modern Germany. We then turn to uh, in some ways the most profound event of our lives, the collapse of, uh, of communist regimes and their transformation and failed transformations into uh, proto-capitalist regimes. And then the last part, modernity, more the area I'm going to talk about, my turf, um, the creation of a commercial field of the life sciences and the commercial field of open source. The claim is a common set of mechanisms describes the invention of these different novel forms. Okay, so that's the big, uh, big pitch in the book. Um, and the sort of underlying puzzle for us is this question of, um, the, what we call the black hole of genesis. You know, something social science doesn't do very well. Okay? At its foundational core, um, social science can't explain novelty because it assumes already the existence of persons and that those persons are fixed and have preferences and all these things are there. We're really good at developing models of equilibrium and selection. But we're extremely poor about saying where persons come from, where new entities like organizations come from, where the new markets uh, come from. You know, part of it is that methodological individualism is kind of baggage we carry around, um, and that baggage has axioms that can't explain its own origins. Where do those preferences come from? Where do the people come from? So our argument is we need a theory instead that's a theory of flow, a theory of transformational flow, in order to tackle this question of speciation. Okay? What do I mean by flow? Well, lots of things we think of in the short run as fixed. But not the human body is sort of a good example. Um, we think of ourselves as you know, relatively fixed. Put your nose, you know, feels there, very strong. And notice say, uh, a lovely quote I was reading the other day, George Bernard Shaw's The Irrational Knot. And when 25 years later, the American edition came out, he writes, at present, of course, I am not the author of the irrational knot. Physiologists inform us that the substance of our bodies, and consequently of our souls, is shed and renewed at such a rate that no part of us lasts longer than eight years. He kind of got that wrong. It's actually a shorter period, but I still like this claim. I am not now, nor any atom of me, the person who wrote the irrational knot in 1880. The last of that author perished in 1888, Two of his successors have since joined the majority. <laughs> Fourth of his line, I cannot be expected to take any very lively interest in the novels of my great grandfather. <laughs> Even my personal recollections of him are becoming vague and overlaid with those most misleading of all traditions, the traditions founded on the lies a man tells and at last comes to believe about himself. So, Part of 
know, our inspiration from biochemistry is to think of the body as the reproduction of chemicals. Things go in, things turn around, things go out. Well, we want to think about the invention of social roles and social things like organizations in the same way. Um, I'm going to give one example today, It'll take some time, which is the analysis of, uh, of essentially new person, scientists, entrepreneurs, something we certainly take for granted, particularly on this uh, part of the campus, but actually 40 years ago was a rather heretical and often punished activity here on this campus, not to mention uh, uh, around the country. And a new organizational form dedicated by a technology firm that was a strange amalgamation of practices from the world of commerce and the world of university labs, financed by new commercial entities, venture capital firms. Okay, so <coughs> the components of the theory are three. We have this network version of Darwin, we call it, the, the autocatalytic um, uh, story about transformational flows. We focus, unlike many structural sociologists, on multiple networks. You see the ways in which multiple networks um, create resource and biographical feedback to transform who persons are. And then with a series of network folding mechanisms that are essentially our version of, uh, of mental. Um, what do I mean? Some of you are going to be deeply familiar with autocatalysis. Others are going to say, what the heck is uh, autocatalysis? It's an idea from Manfred Eigen. He won the um, uh, Nobel Prize in Chemistry, I think, in 1967. The uh, initial papers on autocatalysis came later. 1971 is a classic paper with Peter Schuster in 1977. The person we learned about these ideas from, Walter Fontana, was a, a student of uh, Peter Schuster. It's a chemical definition of life. So I'll read the phrase, a set of nodes and transformations in which all nodes are recreated by transformations among nodes in the set. And for us as a social scientist, that's a deeply relational phrase. Okay? It has added the idea of self-reproducing cycles. So change nodes from molecules to products or organizations or people and how they're transformed through interaction. A set of organizations and transformations in which all organizations are created by transformations among organizations in the set. For our business, for network analysis, the important insight here is that networks aren't simply transmission pipes. Most work in network analysis thinks of networks as things in which ideas diffuse, resources flow, almost, you know, there's a classic paper by uh, Joel Fedoni, Networks as Pipes and Prisons, okay? But what we want to emphasize is that networks aren't just pipes. They often do transformational work. The people are transformed, the organizations are transformed by their experience uh, within these relationships. Uh, so that means there's a mantra that runs throughout the book. Uh, in the short run, People make relations, but in the long run, relations make actors, okay? So that's the piece we're gonna cite over and over again um, that's, uh, that's the core takeaway. You know, if you ask me to do a static analysis in the short run, of course, I'm a methodological individualist. I'm not opposed to methodological individualism as a matter of dogma, but if we're thinking about time scale, then methodological individual, individualism does us very little. It doesn't tell us very much about how people are transformed through their biography over time, as Shaw suggested, suggested to us. So we want to think about the ways in which people carry skills and networks with themselves as they flow through life, as they move and we start then thinking about the relational construction of people. Okay. So a place like Stanford is today, a lecture hall with all of us in it. Some of you were Stanford students, some of you were Stanford visitors, some of you Stanford faculty. We come and go. <coughs> the university stays somewhat fixed, it's on a different time scale, but our presence over time begins to alter what it is that Stanford is, and our time here, and very importantly, our interactions with others start altering 
our conception of cells, and even some people start thinking not so much about their discipline, but about a general science of complexity as a consequence of, uh, of these interactions. So the important thing is to see how autocatalysis changes people and organizations at the same time. Okay. The book looks at three different types of autocatalysis. It looks at production autocatalysis, which is essentially products and how they flow and the skills that are attached with specific products. It looks at biographical autocatalysis, how people are transformed and how new people, new categories of persons are created. And we do a little hand-waving at the hardest question. Uh, which is linguistic autocatalysis, um, which is how is culture transformed through this process? We have some simple models, but you know, if there's a part of the book that, uh, um, that's unfinished, it's clearly um, uh, thinking about how to build up stories about how language changes and culture changes through that process. So the core distinction, a really important distinction uh, that we make is trying to you think about the difference between innovation and invention. Okay? Um, we're going to define, and I'll show you in a minute, innovation as cross-domain recombination of networks. All right? What does that mean? That essentially means that improvement, innovation is improvements on ways of doing things. Okay? It means we move something from one domain to where it's familiar into another domain where it's not so familiar and it gets recombined. Networks shape what the topology of the possible is, where that in innovation can flow and what kinds of shape it has. But what invention represents is not just a new way of doing something, it changes the way <coughs> things are done. It is in fact a new to the world phenomenon because what it represents is spillover across domains that transforms a domain. We have examples uh, soon about this more abstract characterization. So let's see, do I have a, yeah. So the book is laced with maps and visualizations. We think figures help. So let me see if I can talk this through and, and get you to think about it. Um, there are three planes here, an economic plane, the gill system of 14th century Florence, where products are made, where trade goes on, where silk and wool and banking take place. Things with lines around them are firms. Okay. The connections across represent some kind of trade and transaction in the world of economics. Okay. And most social science divides the world up this way. Trade, that's studied by economists. Down here, kinship. Babies, marriage, studied by anthropologists. Here are families. Some families have interactions. Over here are people who are born out of wedlock, illegitimate. They don't have a boundedness around them. Uh, but that's the fun. Up here, you may be a business person. Down here, a father. In this plane of politics, the world of political science, are factions in which people organize uh, political life, making trades among factions. Okay. The roles associated with each of these have identity, okay? The roles are reasonably clear. But the same person is simultaneously a politician, a father, and a business person. That's this line here, okay? It's wrong to assume consistency in preferences across those roles. Very few of us do that in life. Be wonderful in the classroom and go home and kick our dog and fuss at our family. We may be great in the family and show up in the classroom and be cranky and not very nice to our students. We may be generous business people and you know, quite niggardly when it comes to politics and, and uh, um, one's view about uh, uh, transparency or openness. So people are bundles of contradictions across the <coughs> um, domains. What we're interested in is when, when trying to solve a problem in one of those domains, you suddenly pick on an idea from a different one. Trying to forge a business relationship that's not there, suddenly the businessman thinks, is there a political faction I can mobilize? Or, oh, 
There's a different thing they traded in 14th century Florence. Daughters. Daughters get exchanged as a way of cementing business relations. And suddenly, business connections become wrapped up in logics of the family. Okay? And in fact, the story of the transformation of Florence is very much one in which domestic bankers get enrolled into the city council, co-opted into the world of politics, make deals with international bankers using political logic and imposing that into financial logic, recreating the partnership system in an amazing way in which suddenly political and business ties were forged through family relations. Okay? And so much of, we argue, the innovation in Florence was deeply unintentional, was quite conservative, elite families trying to find ways of holding on to power, giving up power in one domain, finding a tool in a different domain that allowed them to enroll new allies in maintaining their position. Similarly, oops, excuse me, went backwards. I, actually, I'm not going to do this because I'm going to give it to you in just a minute. So what we do in the book is develop a series of mechanisms. The one I'm going to talk about today is this idea of transposition and functionality, which we use for Renaissance Florence and the contemporary life science. We also look at the creation of hybrid models, hybrid forms through mechanisms of uh, incorporation and detachment, trying to understand the origins of medieval corporations. It's a series of um, uh, pieces on why industrial clusters form around the life sciences and around uh, um, uh, information technology, and look at the role of migration and homology, the way in which political affiliations remake religious ties and led to the creation of the stock market in the Netherlands, um, and so on. So let me move from this general story to punchline and then the illustration. So where do things called actors come from? They are the concatenation of these transformational flows in which different relationships, resources, and identities get put together. Novelty is when things move across levels and then create tipping across those levels. Something unfamiliar, far away, gets used in a setting and gets repurposed in that setting. <coughs> this, to us, is how we tackle the question, which at least in social science is a big one, of speciation. chapters in the book. It's written with a um, graduate student here at Stanford, Kurt uh, uh, Sandholt. And what we're interested in in this uh, particular story um, is how do we try to understand both the emergence of new forms and the variety of forms. And so to do this, we pose a question that I think uh, uh, hasn't been posed very often. And we think we've in some ways borrowed uh, from a distant domain and methodology to uh, um, to try to do it. The important piece, and please ask questions along the way, this will be a lot more fun for everyone if, if there are questions along the way. Um, we want an account of emergence and entrepreneurship that is not heroic, that is not deeply agentic, that does not rely on the amazing accomplishments of you know, talented individuals. You know, throughout each of the cases in the book, we get stories of, well, wasn't that somebody's effort? Know, that made it possible. Part of what we do in many of the chapters throughout the book is analyze successes and failures, failed cases at building new models, models that never appear. So we have uh, very nice PICO-level data on places where new um, uh, entities don't form. But we also get these questions. John Hedgick gets a lot for his work on Florence. Well, isn't, weren't there exogenous shocks that made this possible? Uh, 
course, there's pushback is, you know, for Renaissance Florence, there are wars with Siena, there are wars with Genoa, there was the Black Plague, which exogenous shock do you want? You know, they were continual. Um, and so what we need to do is fashion a way in which we think about the creation of new forms that doesn't sample on the dependent variable and only pick success cases and only work backwards to tell the story of how they solved a particular problem. We're going to start instead at the beginning and build the story out. Okay. So this idea, I want to keep uh, reinforcing it, that innovation is this interstitial phenomenon. Herbert Kaufman writes about the adjacent possible. And he has this imagery of rooms. And what innovation is is moving something from a nearby room. And this map of room is like a topology of what the future could, uh, uh, could represent. It's a well-studied literature in the social science. You know, think of example that we all live with, the, uh, uh, the camera, the telephone, uh, an older computer, a TV set, and then the thing everyone has in their pocket. Every piece of it was there assembled in a new way. It even has elements to make it familiar. When you take a picture, it clicks. It doesn't have to click. It clicks to make you feel comfortable about what it did in the past. You know, movies, theme parks, and instead we get this mashup, you know, a theme park around uh, popular movies. But a second kind of novelty is what we call transposition. What transposition does is create interstices that weren't previously present, that weren't there before. Okay. So tools from one domain get introduced into a domain where they're foreign. They're unfamiliar. Okay. Precisely because of that, this is less frequent, much more likely to fail because it gets shot down from two directions. Okay. But even failures can often produce fresh, fresh action. So what are examples? Metropolitan Museum of Art. A few of us here might be old enough to remember when the idea of bringing food into a museum was sacred. It was just unheard of that you would have food in a, in a museum. Instead, you would get your hot dog and souvenirs outside. But today, we have the Metropolitan Art Store, in which many people go to a museum not to see the art, but to go to the cafe, to go to the Friday night you know, jazz concert to go to the museum to shop for Christmas. Um, you know, 40 years ago, this would have been unheard of, but this commerce and high art is brought together. A similar example, the sacred, the unholy, and increasingly, what do we see? People like Reverend Dollar teaching finance and prayer simultaneously. And indeed, um, Bob Putnam, who writes about the mega churches uh, in his recent book, American Grace, talks about the compelling way in which the mega churches draw 20, 25,000 people to the Houston Astrodome. They talk about how much financial independence and financial responsibility is, in fact, a, a spiritual obligation. These may be transpositions that fail, but it's that distance you want to think about. We Locally, we have a familiar one, the Oakland A's and Moneyball. What was Moneyball? Moneyball was technique used by Wall Street, arbitragers to find undervalued stocks. It gets transposed in the baseball of, can we find underplayed baseball players who can't really hit all that well, but they can get on base because they take lots of pitches. And the A's started this, now, Saber metrics. I don't know how many of you were sports fans, but after a baseball game or a basketball game, you can get a statistical analysis of the event that boggles the mind and certainly was not part of the world as recently as 15 years ago. Think of the world of cooking. You know, Betty Crocker, wholesome food. I had the pleasure back in March of having a meal with uh, Ferran Adria. Um, in Barcelona, and he showed us the ideas that he developed uh, um, at Il Bulli, and a lot of the new dishes came from going to industrial labs and looking for what's cool equipment that I can get to force Parmesan and pasta flour together to have not 
the tube, the pasta come out that you put Parmesan sauce on it, but the, the thing itself expressed Parmesan. And if you look through the 1,645 uh, recipes that Obuli captured while it was uh, while it was supplied, almost every one of them required specific industrial equipment uh, to, uh, to actually make it. So these are the examples I want you to think about that are transpositions. Um, usually they bring shock associated with them, some image that you can't do it that way. And the people who initially do it usually find that uh, uh, they come under attack by others. And they're really like the horse part too. Okay, so the people who are more likely to do it are people who somehow simultaneously sit in two worlds. They have a foot in two camps, and they're able to toggle back and forth between. Um, they act as agents of transposition because they carry practices from one domain um, into another. Um, they're often, as I emphasize, trespassers. They are not, it's really important to emphasize this, these are not boundary spanners playing import-export games. Okay. They're not, hey, what's valuable over here? I'll bring it here and charge a price for it. This is not a world of arbitrage. Um, instead, often these transpositions are quite unintentional. For Adria, one of the interesting challenges for him back in, uh, uh, in uh, the early 90s was this question of, if I'm going to make food like this, I can't serve an a la carte menu because the investments in the equipment are so substantial. I'm going to have to have a fixed menu. I'm going to have to, in an almost tailorous fashion, have one person make a dish all night long and serve it and fix it. So in the context of what the world thinks is immense creativity, he actually has kind of the oldest engineering model of a single person making a single thing. One of the reasons it was only open six months a year, he said, was he couldn't ask people to work six, 12 months like that because it was so intense. And they needed six months to go invent new dishes because after a while, people get tired of that fixed uh, uh, repertoire. Okay, so the image here is someone encountering a problem, searching around for an alternative. Um, and as they look for an alternative, they carry the baggage of the world they come to into this new domain where it's potentially fresh. Okay. Um, so the example I want to give is something. Sure. Yes, please. Um, you're using um, invention and transposition as in a process. I, I, mm -hmm. uh, not quite. Okay. Transposition is the mechanism that produces invention. Okay. And innovation. Recombination. Okay. So recombination generates. You know, important innovation. The iPhone is remarkable, but it is a recombination of things already there. Yeah. Invention is when you move across those networks and the networks are transformed in the process so that you don't, you know, it's hard to imagine at Stanford University that the vote in 1968 to create a technology licensing office, which today we celebrate, passed by one vote in the faculty senate and it was a one-year temporary authorization. Now, today we say we're an entrepreneurial you, the New Yorker has a story about us, all these things happen. But when it started, that was an extraordinary move uh, that was, uh, it was necessary. And here's a good example. So these companies develop odd, hybrid, strange models, for-profit entities that were dedicated to doing fundamental scientific research. That's, you know, there were examples, things like Bell Labs, RAND, uh, Lincoln Labs, uh, but these were standalone labs inside companies. So here you had a commercial entity doing fundamental research, deeply horizontal flow of information, not a corporate vertical flow of information, project-based organizational work, unheard of for the academy. It was as if Rebecca's working and her work gets hot and Mark drops his work to help her for the next year. You'd never do that in academia, right? <laughs> you know, we don't work that way. Roger Kornberg, at the time, said when he was creating Company DNAX, that one of the reasons he was interested in it was because the university was such an unusual entity. The 
quality of your colleagues mattered some, but actually in some respects, if you had co colleagues who weren't so super smart, that was good for you because you'd get more grad students. Uh -huh. <laughs> he wanted to be in a setting in which whoever's work was hot, people would drop what they're doing and move to that, okay? Very hard imagery from an academic point of view. Extremely poor organizational boundaries in a firm. Kornberg again, when he set up PDAX, he had one requirement, no locks on the doors. Now think about that from our point of view today. You can't get around Stanford without cards and badges and keys and what have you. But the world he knew of the university in the 1960s is there weren't locks on the door. So if he was going to start a company, there shouldn't be locks on the doors of the company. And when it was first created on Page Mill Road over there, it did not have locks on the doors. Um, the investors thought that was extremely risky, but he said it should be open access. At the same time, there was something they wanted to protect, and that was intellectual capital. Again, the fusion, think of that, intellectual property and that era of property and science were two very different conceptions. There weren't even intellectual property lawyers back then. They didn't come around until the 1980s or 90s. But here they wanted to file for patents on paper. An enormously unprecedented flow of venture capital money to support these. The VCs had started to work in ICT. They were used to a world in which they would fund prototypes. And a prototype would come along, it would be a balky you know, thing, it didn't work all that well, and customers would help uh, improve it. You can't do that with a cardiology drug or a prostate cancer drug. Prototypes wouldn't do the trick, so they discovered they're gonna have to spin and invest over a much longer period of time. The biggest challenge they faced was how do you keep young scientists with the company over this long period of time? They invented Tom Perkins said, Kreiner Perkins, something that was called junior faculty, no, stock. Uh, it was stock that would vest only after five years, after you'd accomplished a significant scientific problem. What does that sound like? It sounds exactly like tenure. He transposed tenure. What did he do to find prototypes? Papers and cell nature or science would be things you take to Wall Street and say these in the early days were the prototypes. Those are the kinds of transpositions I'm thinking about. Okay, so we want to understand where these companies came from. It was certainly like a dam waiting to burst. Many people thought there was a lot of scientific ferment out there, but there had been no practical application. There was an enormous move within the country and the political level to support uh, university technology transfer circa 1980. Uh, there was an important Supreme Court decision, Diamond Chakrabarty, one vote that had passed the court. Um, rulings had been made, the prudent man rulings that allowed um, uh, university endowments to be invested by professional uh, 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 companies. But all of this just suggests poisonous does it tell you the outcome that you're going to get? And part of what we want to argue, or we argue throughout the book, is the poisonness of a system to reconfiguration and by an invention is as much a part of the problem to be explained as the invention itself. Okay? So we're trying to think throughout the book about this question of when are systems permeable and when do they tip and move in novel ways? Okay. There is no evidence. I've looked, Kurt and I have looked high and low. We cannot find a single executive, a single scientist who worked in the information or computer industry who moved uh, to the world of biotech. This was not a case of moving a template from one domain to the other. Looks buyers, a um, uh, member of uh, the uh, uh, Stanford Board of Trustees. You know? So here's the feedback dynamic today of. Uh, 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 this process said back then we did not have a business model mapped out for the ultimate value proposition. All things we do today. Instead, there was a sense of naivete, ambition, and desire to do something in the green field. Okay, so we take the first decade. We begin in 1972 in the initial Cohen Boyer 
paper was presented at a conference in Hawaii. Uh, the first bioscience firm, CEDIS, was founded then. We go just a decade, 10 years. Okay. By 1981, political and legal foundations are more in place. And by 82, there's second generation companies being founded. So we find the uh, 26 companies that were founded in the first 10 years. Ransacked every data source you can imagine. They did not have at the time, industrial clustering. It's not like they were all in the Bay Area or Boston. Uh, Berkeley, New York City, South San Francisco, Rockville, Maryland, you would have thought outside the uh, NIH would be a right area for these to start. Biogen was one of the earliest companies in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It says Zurich there because Harvard at the time, excuse me, not Harvard, Cambridge at the time had an Italian American mayor who was on a town gown battle and he argued that genetic engineering was incredibly dangerous. He repeatedly used pictures of the atomic mushroom cloud and tap water in which Frankenstein was coming out of your tap water. And he said that was what would happen if we would let Harvard and MIT do genetic engineering. And so there's a 18 month moratorium. Um, Walter Gilbert. Um, argued before the city council that, you know, and people ask him, are you 100% sure this is safe? And he answered, like a good scientist, no, I'm not. Am I 98% sure? Yes. And that was the fateful moment when uh, uh, suddenly the city council passed the, uh, uh, so it wasn't ordained that this would necessarily grow as a cluster in the Boston area. San Diego had an early company, Philadelphia, Minneapolis, Seattle, uh, Seattle had several, Massachusetts, Boulder. Um, we get a sense that they were spread pretty widely. I'm not interested today in whether they were successful or not. That's not important to me, okay? Um, what I want to know is, what we try to figure out is, what combination of practices do they put together, okay? So, we go back in time to read the documentary record from the 1970s about their creation, okay? Sounds like a lot of work, and when we first thought about this, this was pretty uh, daunting. Um, because most of what social scientists do is interview people today about the past. And you get all kinds of selection, selective memory, success bias, and the like. So we wanted to go back to the time and figure out what we could gather back then had the advantage at the year when we started this, I was at the Center for Advanced Study up on the Hill, and the librarian gave her <coughs> annual pitch to the fellows um, about the use of Stanford Library. Okay. Well, first time I was at the Center back in um, Pleistocene era, every faculty member went to, uh, to that meeting. This time only five. And she was, I went just because I liked the librarian. As she was walking out, she kind of shook her head and uh, said, you know, the days of the library are really over. People think the library is Google. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I said, well, could you help us look for archival materials? She said, look, if I can help faculty who's on leave here, I'll be more than happy to do it. So we put her to work. And the amazing thing was how much you're able to find. In this early year, those hearings in Cambridge City Council, the founder of Cinecor, the Wistar Institute in Philadelphia on the Philadelphia Evening News, you know, an enormous amount of documentary material started showing up through her help. We found people who wrote dissertations at the period. Mark McKinney and UC Davis drove up and dropped out 13 boxes of records from 1982 to 84 and said they're finally out of my garage. I wrote this dissertation 20 odd years ago. I'm happy to give this up. We called one person and the person had passed away. His, uh, uh, his, uh, his wife said, we have records in the garage, I'll give them to you. We found you know, notes on napkins. So we're able to put together a pretty nice evidentiary base of what happened back then. We then read science journalists. And then finally, if we're short, we would make phone calls to people. And we always tried to cold call and surprise people rather than set up an interview um, so that we can prompt them to recall something. 
It's kind of getting strange because you tried to create, you, you tried to get the whole universe of, of these new entities, and then, and then you backsourced on that universe. We tried to fill in their individual history. Okay. okay. So we generated a sample. We think it's a full sample. We've matched it with as many different sources as we can. You think you got them all. Hmm? You think you have them all. We think we have them all. Um, and then we try to fill in how much we can from that period about what's the story on this. Okay. Um, and you know, an amazing array of different data sources that, uh, that we drew on for this. So following this, can we develop this for one second? Mm -hmm. Oh, one sure. Second? So the Berkeley Oral History Library is an amazing source that has these interviews. Um, tens of thousands of pages done with founders of science-based companies back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, there are more than 2,000 pages with life scientists, quite, uh, quite useful. LexisNexis will give you the news reports of you know, little company started in San Diego, you know, 1974. Um, Moody's did profiles of these organizations when they first came out, reports for, uh, uh, for investors. If they filed a prospectus with the government, edgar.gov will generate the prospectus. We have hundreds of pages of prospectus. The web of science we use to track their uh, publications through time. Um, and the last bit, the you know, semi-structured telephone call of, hey, what were you doing in 1974? Um, and you know, pushing people to kind of fill in little bits of, okay? Um, so we go through, build these case histories, and then we read across them to figure out what are the unusual, not unusual, what are the core attributes and practices used by each organization. Okay? And we generate a list of 28 things that were, we'll see what they are in a minute, practices that, uh, uh, that they did. 13 of them were present in five or more of the organization. So we decide to draw the line there at five or more in order to be, if you will, the raw stuff, the raw material for assembly. And we code every company by presence or absence of that. It's a method that could be replicated by anyone in this room if you like reading archives and, uh, um, and documents. Okay. Can I ask another um, question about this? Yeah. So, I mean, of course, very intrigued, but I'm trying to figure out how you determine the thingness of the things that constituted the universe. So let me okay. describe the things to you. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we're reading through. We have three worlds in mind. So think about our planes. I should have done this. So the worlds that were part of this were the university, the world of finance, where they get money from, and the world of commerce, their ostensible models or competitors, the pharmaceutical world. Okay, so there's three kinds of, you know, father, politician, businessman, in this case, scientist, financier, corporate executive. Okay, those are our worlds. We try to look at what are the things that come from those worlds. So did they early on sign research agreements with large companies? Yeah. Kind of a fateful decision to hitch your ride to your own science, or to say we really need money, we need new forms of funding, we'll be a boutique, and we'll do work, contract research for large companies. 81% did that in order to stay alive. Another group had, at the time, a noted scientist someone who in the 1970s appeared in American Men and Women of Science. Okay. So clear science imprint. Physically some, located less than 10 miles from a university. One of the things that stood out to us during this period of meeting, MIT had a rule uh, that it developed. You could keep your job, you could be an amphibian if your company was less than eight miles from the dome. What were they thinking? All the companies would be right there. One, that's the way, but see, here's the challenge. We think about that today. That's seeing it through today's lens. Oh, we want economic development around. They saw it through a 1970s lens, which was 
They didn't want their faculty going far away. If they were close, they could show up at both labs in the day. And there was a debate that showed up at the time, how far is too far? And they even had people get in their cars and drive. And like, all right, eight miles, you can be within 45 minutes and get back. There's a T-stop, you can manage this. You know? So it wasn't 10, it wasn't 12. They weren't thinking Kindle Square. Kindle Square did not exist. It was textile factories as far as the eye could see back then in Kindle Square. It was a very decrepit place. Today, it's glass as far as the eye can see. And you think, oh, you want companies around campus. But then, you're absolutely right. How do we keep them showing up in their labs on a daily basis? Okay. The amphibians were people who never quit their day jobs. So this MIT strategy worked. They never left their faculty positions, but they maintained a position with a company. A handful of universities knew UCSD, UCSF, MIT, Stanford, the Hutch up in uh, Seattle, uh, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center allowed this. Some, Harvard said, no, you can't. You can't be both at the time. Uh, did their initial product mix decide to focus on low-hanging fruit? Did they go after diagnostic uh, products, or did they pick vaccines um, as a market in which they could get orphan drug status? Or did they go after new to the world medicines? So that's the, the next characteristic. I'm going through these kind of slowly. It sounds like I sort of need to. Did they have a non-traditional public offering? Today, you know, we've watched this seemingly interminable run up to Facebook finally having an IPO, which is <laughs> gonna happen tomorrow. It's gone on forever. Uh, back then, Amgen, the largest biotech today, in 1983 was going broke. It had two months burning through money, had two months of funding left. Amgen, you'll see, was actually a recombinatorial firm, not an invention firm, and it was run by established people from the world of pharmaceutical science. Um, and the person at the head, very responsible businessman, said, we have no patents, no breakthrough work, and no money. We should shut the company down and ask the lawyer, will you please take the steps to do this and start notifying people? Yeah, that was the plan. Someone in the room said, well, have you heard of these things called an IPO? Um, and they said, yes, initial public offering. That's if you have a product. No, I don't think so. I think it's about excitement. It's a new way of generating money. And the guy said, you're nuts. You know, we'll, there's a whole transcript we have of it is it would be illegal to do it. But there are people on the board who said, no, no, it's a way of building you know, support for your company from people who believe in this new science. Long story short, Amgen had an IPO. It wasn't a huge one, but it kept them alive for another 10 months. In the meantime, they developed uh, EPO and the rest is, uh, uh, a lot of these firms had these non-traditional public offerings. A number of companies said, we don't want the monkeys running the zoo. The scientists can't be in charge here. We need pharmaceutical veterans to come in. Some had all-star scientific advisory boards. Others didn't. Interesting, it's a really remarkable cleavage. The firms that turned out that were more recombinatorial had famous scientists on the board, but were not run by famous scientists. In some sense, you might say the board was like bling to attract status, but it wasn't uh, uh, informing the decisions directly. Um, and a subset had a scientist in charge. There was, in fact, uh, academic running the organization. Part of what we want to do here is figure out What's a method for telling us which attributes cohere with one another and which ones repel? Okay. That's the, the core effort to try to understand this. So, simple way to do it, a matrix, zero, one for um, uh, every organization, try to fill in the cells, um, and then we use hierarchical cluster analysis to try to figure out what's the similarity or dissimilarity distance in terms of um, these different attributes. HCA is a really nice tool for what you might call tweener size samples, smaller than 100, where you don't have statistical power, but more cases than you can hold in your head for doing a simple uh, comparison. 
What it allows you to do um, is do a matrix of 26 organizations by 13 practices. And essentially what I'm going to give you is a dendogram, a textual dendogram that shows you how the pieces go together. And it's a tree diagram that graphically depicts clusters. There's a little art into this science because you have to figure out where to cut the tree. Okay. So if we look at this, this is the clusters that appear. Here are our companies across the top. Here are our characteristics. We choose four. There's a divide there, a divide here, a divide here. You could go up the aggregation and say there's some more differentiation here, but we get four different clusters. We turn it into figuring out, is that the right number? You can see that the steepest gradual is there at four. It seems like that's the elbow that you want. Others have said, why don't you run it at eight? When we run it at eight, one of the clusters breaks apart a little bit. Uh, but essentially, four is the optimal degree of dissimilarity among the group, and it produces a family tree that looks something like this. The importance of the family tree is this group here, under one, were a group of organizations that went into business to do science. Okay, that's what I'm calling a transposition. This group here were a bunch of different models that use science to do business. Okay. How do we know that these are important points of difference? So we go through and take our attributes. We start looking at this cluster one in business to do science. All of them had a notable scientific founder. All but one had an amphibious founder who didn't quit his day job, and he went to laborious lengths to think about does he quit his day job or not. As it turned out, his partner stayed at the Hutchinson Cancer Center. He went off to found Immunex. Many of the staff stayed in both, but fairly we coded as he wasn't an amphibian because he did quit his day job. Um, did they publish? in academic journals in their first five years. You can see those in business that do science are more likely to do that. Over here, they did not. Did they hire a pharmaceutical executive? Did a businessman come in to run? So think about how these attract and repel, okay? So to a pharmaceutical executive, publishing is like what? giving away the crown jewels. These are our ideas we're going to share to someone from the world of science. What does publishing represent? Attribution. Hmm? Attribution. Attribution. Product. Potentially a product, you know, I and in some an sense product. an intellectual product, and in some ways planting a flag, mm -hmm. right? I, if I'm willing to publish, this is how much I know about this, you know, all right. It's also currency. Publications attracted young scientists to move there. Um, I'm trying to think of uh, 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 a person we spoke to. Oh, Axel Ulrich, who is now head of one of the Max Planck's. He was a young postdoc in UCSF at the time and unable to find uh, employment, jumped to Genentech. Um, and for him, his comment was, we had to publish. Publishing would be my only route back out of here. What if this crazy idea failed? Uh, and I've made the biggest mistake of my life. If I don't publish, I can't get out of here. So you see these multiple potential explanations, but if you're in business to do science, publishing was a kind of logical account. If you're in science to do business, Publishing was something that was a crazy idea. So this is the kind of cleavage that you begin to see with these. Two. Yes. Clarification question. In the case of uh, being in business to the science, you mentioned one explanation: the guy couldn't get an academic job, right? But is is there a case in which they get they can get funding? They are in academia, but they get they try to use businesses to fund the Some of a few of the people in the room have heard this story enough times; so they probably don't. Um, We'll want to hear it again, but I'll use it on this large audience. So there's a, um, a story that's told that's a legend today that we're able to track down the legend. 
um, and find out its meaning much more. So um, back in 1976, um, an out-of-work young man, a venture capitalist wannabe, who was later described as a brilliant um, uh, venture capitalist, um, uh, calls up a scientist at UCSM. Um, and uh, um, uh, the scientist is Herbert Boyer. Um, and um, Boyer was not a world famous scientist. He was a newly promoted associate professor who had just gotten an NIH grant turned down. Okay. He gets a phone call from, from uh, uh, the fellow who would eventually be the famous co-founder of Genentech with him, who calls and says, could I meet you? And he said, how'd you get my name? And he said, oh, I'm going down a list of people who attended the recent Asilomar meetings about the rules for recombinant DNA um, research. And Boyer's a smart guy. He says, oh, so Paul Bird turned you down. Uh, and he said, yeah, I'm going down the list alphabetically. So that was the way he was going. Boyer says to him, I'll meet you at 4.45 Friday. So what does 4.45 Friday mean to you? You have 15 minutes, close it down. There are other meanings. Cocktails. Thank you. Well, if the meeting goes well, we can drink. What else? This is before UCSF was at Mission Bay. Hard as hell to park around that old campus. Maybe I'm going to test this young guy's medal to see if he's serious. Shows up during rush hour. Other definition? The situation? I don't want my colleagues to see me meeting with him. But, um, so the meeting was pregnant with multiple possibilities. They ended up talking all night. The young guy says, I think I can raise $200,000 for you. Boyer doesn't think, go buy a Jaguar. He thinks instead, this is how I can pay my postdocs that I can't fund because I didn't get the NIH money. So he transposes the money back into his domain. So money is important, but he sees it not in terms of you know, wealth, but I'm going to use it to fund these other activities. So this is why it's really important throughout the cases in the book, conservative motivation become the basis for all kinds of interesting uh, uh, invention. Okay. Um, so we have these groups who want to figure what causes this family tree to develop the way it does. The first dividing point is this amphibious uh, founder. The next one is how close you are to campus. And then after that, are you willing to engage in contract research? So, series of clusters, this first cluster, an amphibious founder, they publish. They do not have a scientific advisory board that they're deeply reliant on. The second cluster looks more like, let's have a senior pharmaceutical executive in charge. Scientists get involved, but they're on an advisory board. They don't publish. They look very much like spin-offs from academic labs today. Another group focused on diagnostics, little r, big d. They ransack the academy for licenses. Where can we find ideas? This other group, a deliberately assembled business venture, they locate far from campus. They grow by acquisition and merger. They look much more like a conventional um, tech company. Okay. If you look through the records, you see these stories. You know, ISI. Um, 1992 comes out with a statement saying that uh, Genentech leads the industry in all three categories, hubs, citations, citations per paper. They also say it does pretty well compared to America's best universities. It ranks second in competition and rankings with, well, second only to MIT, ahead of UCSF, Berkeley. You know, I remember when I first presented this data once at um, um, at Harvard, and, and Wally Gilbert was in the audience, I was nervous about saying this, you know, uh, in front of him, and his hand shot up immediately, and I, you know, I know when you get a hard question, you walk towards the person, not away from him, so I walk up this, of course they can write more impactful papers. Why don't we publish? We publish to get our students' jobs, we publish to get grants renewed, 
We publish to get salary increases. We slice and dice our work in order to do all the things academics do for funding. These guys can put all the pieces together on one home run paper to claim turf in a new area. They're going to get cited more because of that. It was really fascinating to hear people turn the logic upside down of how much the academic game has business features and how much doing science in the world of business allows different features to uh, uh, develop of your science. Um, second cluster, David Hausman from MIT said, I call my company Integrated Genetics. I didn't want just an R&D company. I wanted it doing all these different things. Uh, third cluster, Cinecor, we thought it was a lot cheaper to roam academe and pay a royalty. We didn't have to set up facilities. We are talent scouts. Fourth cluster, you know, Amgen claiming what was second nature to them because they hired people from the pharmaceutical world. We knew how to do reports. We knew how to do uh, planning. We knew how to do budgets. We might have been a small company, but we all brought this expertise from, uh, uh, from this other world. So we try to, let's figure out what's an outcome variable we can look at to verify these uh, clusters. Um, so we go to, uh, uh, to the web of science and we say, what does the publication record look like post-IPO? It might be you publish up to, you have an IPO, you get rich and you say the science is over, now it's time to uh, uh, hunker down and be a business. So we want to look if they publish post-IPO. We first run the numbers and the numbers are completely completely wacky. All of these make sense, but these are so off the charts in terms of number of publications and citations, it doesn't even seem like a fair comparison. So we try to, is it you know, a Genentech effect? No, it wasn't. And then it dawned on us, precisely because they're in business to do science, what do they do in their papers? Each other. They cite each other. Very good. So we remove self cites. They acted too much like academics. So we take out all self cites and all self organizational cites. So cites to all other papers from within your organization. It still turns out that the average number of publications is dramatically different between cluster one and these others. And they also publish impactful work in terms of citations. Okay, so what are the consequences? I want to do, finish up, along, going slowly, I'm sorry, uh, in two senses, okay? So in a narrow sense, the story we want to see is these three recombinatorial variants, mixed practices, uh, borrowed from past experience to create new kinds of science-based companies in which traditional pharmaceutical commerce and academic science come together. One variant instead takes science and combines it with the world of finance and invents new models on the fly. This is the one where invention comes through. And the important thing to realize is depending on those two different starting places, you have dramatically different interpretations of the bits. Okay? So all of these, not all, many of these companies over time get acquired. For those in science to do business, being acquired is cause for a celebration. It's a liquidity moment, as it's called. You know, they're thinking, holy cow, we've uh, struck it rich. Let's head to Napa Valley. Let's buy a home on the main seashore. Uh, let's get a yacht in San Diego. For the in business to do science, they have a wait. They have a funeral procession. They have a sad party. They fight dramatically not to actually be acquired. You know, think of the past three or four years here as Genentech tried to fight Roche's acquisition. Up in Seattle, they had a three-day wait. They put a boat out on uh, uh, Lake Union and sunk it as the immunoid culture died. One firm, Genetics Institute, puzzled the daylights out of us because they kept patenting under the name Genetics Institute nine years after they were acquired. I talked to Hank Greeley in the law school. I talked to Becky Eisenberg at Michigan. And how can a company that's defunct still be filing patents under its name? 
They gave me every cockamamie explanation, your submarine patents, all these things. Finally, I noticed all the patents had the same lawyer's name on it. Googled him, found him, called him up, and he started laughing. He says, you're the first person who ever had. And I said, well, what's behind him? He said, we didn't want to give up our freedom, our independence. We got acquired by American Home Products. In two years, they were acquired by Warner Lambert. In another two years, Pharmacia bought them. After that, Pfizer bought them. Then we were sold off to Wyeth. We figured nobody at the top of the corporation would notice, and they did. We just kept <laughs> filing under Genetics Institute, because we, that's who we were. And today, they have survived. Within Wyeth, they are Genetics Institute, the biotechnology arm of Wyeth. So in some sense, you know, their dream uh, continued. So the very same thing, you know, acquisition gets coded differently depending on which side. We talked earlier about our publication, scientific leadership, are they giving away the credentials? Okay, so what modest little story about the invention of a form through recombination and transposition. Now let me finish with the functionality side. So what happened? Scientific productivity of firms in business to do science begins to transform the landscape of contemporary science. Things that were heretical back then, we now name buildings after them, we celebrate and we encourage it. The commercial success of the firms in science to do business transforms the world of the pharmaceutical industry. No longer standalone, isolated R&D labs, labs much more connected than 2002. Now Kendall Square is in place. Uh, Daniel Vesella, the CEO of Novartis, decides to shrink dramatically his lab in, uh, 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 in Basel, where 6,000 scientists work, and shoehorn a new lab in between the Whitehead, uh, MIT, and Biogen in, uh, in Kendall Square. He's asked by the Financial Times, why in the world are you doing this? You know, this is extremely costly. You're disrupting people's labs. And he gives a quirky answer that to those in the know is a signal he knew a lot, but to FD confused him massively. He said, there's a great Irish bar there. There's a place called Plow and Chairs. Has anyone ever been in uh, that bar? If you walk in it around 10 o'clock at night, suddenly there's a whole lot of people in white lab coats <laughs> stopping by on a Monday night for a full against. Okay? So the FT folks said, ah, they thought Marshall, you know, famous uh, economist, secrets of industry are in the air. Oh, you want your scientists interacting with other scientists. He said, no, I want my scientists to find jobs and lead. There all, well, he said, because only if they go away and move to other places can I hire people from other places in. And so what he had in mind was people would leave, the Vardis would in fact, and today, in a pretty dramatic way, if you ask someone at MIT, what is the most science-based company in Kindle Square, they're likely to say Novartis. So here, established conservative organization gets transformed by this recombinatory process. Today, economists Ian Coburn and, and Scott Stern argue the life science tradition system has replaced this traditional divide. So small scale change, creation of this new form has this catalytic effect in a broader view, transforming both universities and the pharmaceutical world. So both recombination and uh, 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 transposition can give rise to new models, but what recombinatorial novelty does is create these new inner sites that we emphasize. So practices that flowed across these interstices have these feedback effects that remake the domains out of which they came and moved into. I'll stop there. <coughs> probably gone long enough. Thank you for your patience.
other kind of more transformational one earlier in the decade and then kind of more recombinatorial one moving into the space that was to some extent created by the original language or a bit more, much more than That's a really good question. We've thought about um, several ways of looking at the timestamp. So it's a terrific um, idea. Is it the case that radical ones start and more conservative, or do conservatives start and the more radical ones spill out? Um, are radical and conservative connected to particular geographic locales? It turns out there is no standard diffusion story. They are in and out okay, through this period, and no initial geographic story. Okay. What happens over time, your intuition is very good, in the communities where high-tech clusters took off, the area, <coughs> Boston, San Diego, you got more of the radical ones, okay? And in the communities, Washington, New York, Research Triangle, um, Seattle's a kind of half and half case, Houston, uh, the other places where there are possibilities, you had only the recombinatory. Okay? The next chapter of the book argues that those form the basis of industrial districts in which practices continue to flow out of the organization and commercial entities collaborated with one another and with universities in a way that opened up the districts. So, yeah. Mark? So this is a, a very nice historical case study. I know they got others in the book. And so I'm wondering overall if you came up with any models or conceptualizations that might actually help you to predict when you would see these things. Okay. Um, so there are two ways. I mean, the book is based on the idea that um, uh, agent based modeling and historical work are symbiotic with one another. Okay. They're what the models led us to just figure out what are potential counterfactuals. Okay. I'll give you a, a taste of that and then try to more directly answer the question. So one of the interesting issues is why would a group of scientists decide to be amphibians? You know, what was at the core of pushing them to do this? And can we figure out the story of that? We know um, thanks to the openness of uh, the Office of Technology Licensing at Stanford about the history of a lot of the early inventions at Stanford. And so we develop a simulation that takes the rules that people used at the time in their heads. There's going to be resources flowing in. I use it to support my lab. There's going to be resources flowing in. I give money back to my undergraduate institution. Uh, there's going to be resources going in, I'm going to get rich, you know, these different kind of images people have. And then run the simulation to see what causes the practice to diffuse to other labs. You know, could we predict which other labs are going to get it? Uh, proximity turns out not to be a very good answer. Incentives in terms of wealth doesn't appear to be a very good answer. But the fascinating thing is predation ends up being very powerful. The fear that somebody nearby might commercialize something that would impinge on your scientific autonomy leads you to commercialize. Okay, so it's sort of a really interesting feature in that. So that was an unexpected emergence of, of, of a rule-based system. Well, what, we try, you know, what we try to do throughout the cases is not prediction in the sense that you're thinking about when will this happen, but rather to say something about what are the kinds of features that make systems poison for these kinds of changes. Okay. I'm just saying, what about the institutional changes, right? Because if you work in another institution, you're bound by certain. So I want to. So this is where Rebecca, I thought, did a lovely job of. Uh, um, uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, reading my past work, I don't want to tell the story that institutions are these higher order things that have impinged down, that institutions are these emergent things that grow out of the feedback dynamics of network interactions, okay? So the rules that we have in place are very much things made out of flows of people. We were 
extraordinary fortune at this university to get lucky early. Happy Koo will say it's great to have morals and transparency when you're an early success. Our rules are kind of open. Other universities that are late in the game haven't had a payoff. You know, you've seen Northwestern with Lyrica, their ads. You know, they're very late to this game. They're desperate for a home run. The rules are the outcomes, not the input. Okay. The reason I'm asking this question is so you didn't want to look at models that were just successful, right? Right. And yep. so, we need examples of failures. Usually, the failures are examples of relatively wooden applications of trying to look at success and sort of thinking that, you know, oh, there is a recipe. Take this, take that, and stir. Okay? This is a story throughout all the cases, not of a recipe, but of a mode of cooking. Okay, so if you think about how to cook, multiple different ingredients might make it work. It's a topology of the possible. Every success of the high-tech district has a different anchor tenant, different set of organizing principles, components in one sense, but the same set of rules. All of the failures have a well-endowed 800-pound gorilla that says play, actually everybody uses 800-pound gorilla, I've been corrected multiple times. The biggest gorilla is about 550 pounds. So it just doesn't work as well. Um, has a 550-pound gorilla that says play by my rules. So no cluster develops in Washington because you have to play by NIH rules. No cluster develops in New York because the financial community dominates. No cluster develops in New Jersey because the pharmaceutical industry dominates. On and on like that. Okay. So very important to see cooking rather than ingredients. Yeah. Um, you'll excuse me for lack of context that I haven't had in the past, but um, in the current moment of institutions of academia being redistributed and sort of reframed by the online possibilities. Ah, <laughs> um, I, I want to ask you, how would you feel if someone were to use your research as a foundation and an argument for transdisciplinary academic inquiry and uh, transdisciplinarity as being generative in university spaces when information can be farmed out and distributed? Um, well, let me try. There's an expert in the room. I might uh, uh, toss it to him. Um, so let me try two pieces of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me know. Let me you, know. you uh, and I mean this in a positive way, you mush two things together. Yeah. Okay. So, so one was this idea um, about interdisciplinarity. Okay. Um, we're busy uh, uh, studying labs here at, uh, on this campus where um, students come from distant terrains to, uh, 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 to work um, with you know, physicists, uh, computational biologists, biochemists um, together in a group. They do not settle quickly on a lingua franca. That's very important to understand that. They instead learn to ask questions that actually reveals their lack of knowledge and, that, um, and find ways of keeping conversations going so they can understand. Now, can that be recreated on the World Wide Web in, uh, in distance education? I'd rather doubt it. Okay. Um, can distance education <coughs> provide a platform of common knowledge that people may eventually be able to? Um, so I'm not going to go as far as uh, um, you know, are, are the moments we're seeing now with distance education, you know, the beginning of remaking of the university, um, as we know it, it may well be that we're in the early stages of that. Certainly nobody back at this time knew it. Um, if you took a lesson from this, the people who were in it to expand their science rather than to make money, ended up making money. Those who went into it for business mm. reasons ended up making money in the short run, but not having a huge impact in the long run. So, interesting if you want to push that. Yes, please. Um, so, referring to kind of the central idea of 
novelty being generated by cross pollination <coughs> between different regions. Mm -hmm. What's to prevent these regions from just completely collapsing into each other? Like, how are how is variation maintained between regions, and do you have any idea of how that could have gotten there in the first place? Um, great question. Really terrific question. So one of the challenges when the things mash up um, is the amount of heterogeneity is quickly reduced. Okay, so Rebecca referred to a project I'm looking at now. We're trying to study metrics of evaluation in areas like humanitarian aid, where suddenly people from the world of consulting and commerce and government are moving into areas like refugee relief to evaluate whether or not okay, one of the challenges is they use metrics that are very outcome-based, not very process-based. Okay? So an outcome-based might be, you know, what is your administrative cost? Um, an organization like Doctors Without Borders does really poorly on that. Why? Because they have doctors working for them. If your measure is do they get on the scene in Haiti faster than any other organization, they do particularly well. Okay? So often this hybridization reduces the variation in the first place. But what that sets in motion are refugees leaving that world that go back into other settings. So one of the things that our book looks at is how you move from the world of commercial entities that are in business to do science into the world of software where you get commercial enterprises doing open source in which the firms do it, but the ideas get give, given away and that others build on. So you have to think of those planes that when they come together, they set in motion the possibility that others are going to move out and leave those. Okay, and then over time, you know, these flows are continually in. From our point of view, biographies are always the story. The planes don't exist independent of the people, and the networks are, you know, essentially the zipper that zips up people's career biographies. So our focus is on the flows of people at which concretize into those domains. Yeah. I have more of a wonderful question. You, you referred at the beginning uh, the possibility of people being transformed. Mm -hmm. And uh, more recently you said that you wanted to treat institutions as the result as not as the there are some people I know, for example, that become this institutional economist called Jack Hudson, mm -hmm. who writes about uh, downward causation. I don't know if you have a question. And, and he knew that institutions can transform individuals. But I think in your story, you attribute this role to networks, not to institutions. Is that right? That's much more fair. And, and why is that? <coughs> in a way, it goes back to the, the woman's question before you. If the institutions exist independently of the individuals that make them up. It's a little hard to tell the story about where do the institutions come from in the first place, right? Okay. So, Watson's story is a little bit like an ether cloud hanging above us that rains down on us and we're transformed by the rain, but you want to know what caused the change in weather so the cloud got there in the first place. So. As a network person, it's got to come to me out of flows and interaction, not that the institutions exist in independently of those interactions. Rodrigo, you're not, neither of you were happy with that answer, so. Um, no, I have a, I have a different question. Um, you, your, your general approach is really related to change because you're, you're interested in it. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could comment on not change, but uh, isomorphism or, or, or similarities or, 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 or these same kind of processes uh, generating um, uh, permanence or with the absence of Yeah, I don't, I don't want to go, I mean permanence sounds like a very uh, uh, dead end kind of question to go to. Right? You, know, you heard the opening story. This is a world of flux. Um, you know, this is uh, at the core of, uh, uh, of the idea. All right? That things spread and pass and diffuse to different domains? Absolutely. 
Okay, and every time something spreads and passes, the copy of it is a little bit off and a little bit wrong. But a, a lot of innovation is failed copy, right? Um, but rarely does diffusion alone lead to invention. Okay, what we're trying to think about is what inventions happen that then trigger people thinking about copying them. Okay. So I don't see the story of permanence there. Uh, you're, you know, if you're thinking about that ancient article written you know, by my great grandfather, um, that was a story about how things spread and diffused, but it was also a story about as things became more similar that set in motion differentiation. In the back, wait a second. Yeah, uh, for sure, I must say, I found your talk very really fascinating. <laughs> um, and my question is for recombination and transposition, what is it that is being transposed and what is it that is being recombined? And um, the extension is where do these things that are being recombined and transposed, where do these things come from? Well, it's a variant of this, uh, this earlier question. So we, we're trying to think, I mean, throughout the book, Social distance is one of the key features, okay? Does something, this is the Kaufman language, come from an adjacent room, okay? A telephone and a camera, a computer and a telephone. You know, those are things that are proximal in terms of the industries that develop them, that in terms of the kinds of organizations involved in them, in terms of scientific training that underlies them, okay? Wall Street, and the church are distant relations, right? Okay. So when things that are proximal are moved, that's a relatively small shift, okay? And what you get is an interesting, important mashup of different things, all right? Right, I, I get that, but you say that when things are moved, so what are these things that are being moved? Practices, attributes, skills, uh, persons, okay. So think, think, right. and, you know, and like think about careers. Practices. Think about practices. You know, I observe a lab that works a particular way here at Stanford, and I come back and think, wow, I could do that in my classroom. Okay, that's a proximal thing. I rarely see a priest and go, that was an incredible sermon. What if I tried that in my classroom? Okay, you know watching the one distance to the other. Last year in, uh, uh, in an MBA class I teach, I brought in a priest uh, from a mega church, and you know, many of the MBAs were deeply skeptical. By the time he left, they were like, the guy was amazing. He had more ideas about how to measure the efficacy of events than I could have possibly imagined. You know, why did they think it was so novel? Because of the distance it came from. Okay. So, first thing we want to think about is distance in that regard. What makes a transposition, though, is not just a recombination, it's that that practice.